Good morning to everybody. I'm Jessica Brooks-Philippe. I'm the Educational Services Librarian at South Central Regional Library Council in Ithaca, New York. And I'd like to welcome you all to the NY3R's webinar, Show Me the Data, Effective Visual Communication. So if you have any questions for our speakers today, you can just type them into the question area of the command module, and the speakers will be answering questions throughout the program. And now here's Mary Carol Lindblom, the Executive Director of SCRLC, to introduce today's speakers. Good morning, everyone. It is sunny and bright and gorgeous in Ithaca, and I hope it is where you are as well. Um, I welcome you on behalf of South Central Regional Library Council and the NY3Rs Association, Inc. The NY3Rs has sponsored this series of assessment and outcome webinars, and they are archived. Um, there will be a few additional webinars coming your way in January, including one on survey design, focus groups, and then Barbara Stripling will be doing one specifically for school librarians and anyone else that might be interested. Um, the webinars are part of the Information Infrastructure of New York Initiative on Assessment and Outcomes, and the NY3Rs are comprised of the nine regional resource reference and research councils of New York State. So for more information about the NY3Rs, visit www.ny3rs.org and uh, then the archived assessment programs are there as well. And the archived assessment programs are also available on the assessment libguide that is launching. And the best way to find that, if you throw in into Google, um, libguide assessment NY3RS, then um, it's about the first thing that pops up. Maybe the only thing. I don't know. So, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Liz Chabot has been the college librarian at Ithaca College since 2003 in August, and you can read all of the other information about her and her thoughts on um, what a successful library is um, in the, um, the flyer that accompanied this workshop. But I also want to say that in addition to all of that, She's been a very engaged member of the Assessment and Outcomes Working Group, and she's offered great ideas for topics and speakers, um, plus um, working with all of our various documents, our planning materials, and now a webinar. With Liz today is Dan Taylor, who is the Library Technology Specialist at Ithaca College, and he is also a freelance designer and owner of D Plus D Studio, um, also located in Ithaca. So Liz and Dan, um, take it away. Okay. Yep. Well, Hello. Good morning, everyone. We're, we're here in Ithaca, as Mary Carroll says, and it's very sunny. I want to start off by mentioning that uh, we in no way consider ourselves to be exhaustive experts on um, data. I think we've got some great ideas and, and some things to show you that we think are good examples and some good principles. And at the end, um, we'll mention some sites that you can take a look at, but we'll get started now. So let's start with, oh, sorry. Let's start with answering the question, why, uh, why, uh, why even use uh, like um, data visualization? And so here, right now, um, you see up on the side are some monthly circulation charges from you know from from our library for the past year. And this gives good data. It shows what's going on, but it's really not something that you can kind of see at a glance and kind of go through. Um, however, when I put it into a, a data uh, visualization, so with this chart you can immediately see that some things are going on. For instance, you have uh, take out a lot more materials than our, than our uh, faculty, but you can also see uh, things quickly. Say, for instance, around summertime, uh, the student um, circulation drops steeply, as you would uh, kind of expect. It also drops somewhat uh, you know, uh, steeply for the faculty, but not nearly as much. But you can kind of see also how the trends kind of follow the same kind of academic year. Yeah, and it, it, I think this is a very striking visualization for folks, and, and we, we know uh, from looking at our data historically over the years that 
um, the peaks in, in March, April, and October also correspond with interlibrary loan requests. So we use this information to think about our services and actually staffing our services as well. And I think also what's really great about data visualization is it's a, it's a really compelling way of showing your data. And also it's, it's striking, it uh, really engages people, and it really allows um, trends to be seen very quickly instead of having to study the actual data in the spreadsheet, for instance. Right. A page of numbers, you'd have to really suss out, whereas if you look at the visualization, you immediately see what the trend is. Exactly. So let's take a peek at some of the different kinds of, um, of um, data visualization. So we have charts, which we're all familiar with, um, pie charts. There are arc charts. There are um, scatter or spatter charts, scatter charts. There's all kinds of different charts out there, and I'm sure many of you have seen any of them going on. Um, in addition, there are also, you could look at a word cloud as another way of um, giving uh, data information. For instance, um, that's on this a middle one is from the Lorem Ipsum, um, which is a kind of filler text that, um, that um, designers text. And you can see how, for instance, a dolor is used way more often than, say, anim, it a little bit more often because of the size of the words, give, you know, give how many words are being used in repetition. Yeah, I, I think word, cl word clouds, I think, are, are were, were very hip for there a while there, and I don't see them used quite as much anymore. But I know that um, when libraries are looking at search terms, what search terms are being input into databases, um, if people are searching your website, what are they looking for? And this kind of information helps you, I think, in revising your website and determining what are the high priorities, what are, what are the terms that confuse people. And this is a, a good way to highlight um, in degrees of color and, and size what are, what are the important things to, to highlight. So visually, this gives you sort of a good mind map, I guess, of, of what people are doing on a website. Exactly. Um, and then a final version, and there are other versions in this, but we're just kind of going through the major ones, um, are like is the um, infographic, which has definitely, I think, been on the rise for a while. Um, and there are some really compelling ones out there. This is one that I created based off of our usability testing when we were testing um, our website on smartphones and seeing, um, like, you know, like, how people use our like our website and things of this nature, and some of the things that we discovered. So this kind of goes through showing how many people were tested, who was tested on what device, um, and then some of the lessons. So it's a really quick way of kind of scanning through what we did. And we handed this out, and so I, I think yes, um, we learned some things from this, and we're able to visually present this. And I think we did a presentation here on campus, and it was able and. A, one shot piece of paper here, we were able to graph and we were able to display quite a bit of information that otherwise would have, I think, just, I would say, have been kind of boring reporting text. And instead, we created a visual, which people could look at. And I think with visual sometimes, too, you, you have the audience's attention. Because they're listening to you, they're not reading the text as much. Yeah, and I think there's a lot that people glean quickly and, you know, can really, um, with our visuals, you know, we're a very visual society and we really kind of take in a lot of information that way. So let's talk about speaking to your audience. Um, it's always really important to bear in mind who you're talking to and what they're looking to get from you and what you're looking to get from them. Um, and I think a lot of it is that, like, you really want to make sure, for instance, like, if you're looking to speak to a very sophisticated audience, you know, you probably don't want to use, say, Comic Sans or something as a font, is that you really want to have something that's striking and professional and sharp and clean, versus if you were, if your audience were children, then obviously something like Comic Sans or more fun fonts are, are a really great way of kind of, you know, showing that kind of uh, levity and things of that nature. Yeah, we really liked um, this presentation. We like this site because uh, we think it has many wonderful elements in it, um, including the the font size changes, the strength of the font changes. So you you immediately see the point that they really want to make here is that diarrhea kills 800,000 children under five each year. Your eye immediately goes to that and sees that. 
And, and then you can see the next largest font is around treatment, and there's a direct link, and they're telling you the treatments that would be effective. Um, transmission next, and they're explaining how it's transmitted. And you can see, um, and Dan will talk a little bit about the visual layout. They're, they're using this space well. They're communicating a lot of information um, that they've gleaned in a way that's very visually appealing and visually, and it's striking. And, and Dan will talk a little bit about the child looking up, et cetera, but the way things move from left to right, I think yes. it's effective. So let's just break this particular um, graphic down slightly so that, as Liz mentioned, for instance, the, like the, um, the font weight the, um, is probably black, I would assume. For, um, the, uh, for the 800,000, but that really is giving the impact of what's going on. Also notice that they're using a, like, a, like a small child, which is really a compelling thing. Most of us respond to you know, children in need. This is something that is kind of an innate human, human trait, and they're using it effectively to really draw you in. Um, and as Liz mentioned, so you're kind of reading down, but then you see the child looking up and up to the right, and they're using that to then draw your eye up into this um, diarrhea deprives the water or the body of water and salts and so on. And because this is meant for a Western audience that reads from left to right, um, they're really using that effectively so that the child is shooting you off up to the right and then you're starting to read down. And um, also notice that um, how things are contained. Containment and proximity are really important aspects of graphic design. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the principles of design. But notice that they've encapsulated rehydration, zinc supplements, nutrient-rich foods within a box, and then there's a line leading directly to the, to the stomach of the child where these nutrients are absorbed and where they're introduced into the body. Um, so it's really kind of a quick and easy, effective way to really show a lot of things going on that you're, I think you're taking in because you have all this information, but you're not really taking it in a conscious level. It's more of a subconscious level. So we think this is a really effective um, display of, of information in a graphic way as well as using an image that's compelling. Exactly. So let's um, talk about some good design um, there was a book out recently, sorry, the name escapes me, but it basically lays out uh, design into six principles. Um, and these are good for both web and for print. Um, the tricky part now with um, web design now, especially with responsive design, um, and like and responsive design, if you're not aware, is a, is a way of designing so that um, no matter what device you're on, you still have your same exact site, but things may fall in different places, they may slide underneath each other, get smaller, um, become more simple. So there are all kinds of things that can happen with responsive design, but still the same kind of principles apply where you want to be really thinking about the way that you're laying things out, the way that you're delivering your information. Um, so the first principle we're gonna talk about is balance. And balance in design is the same as balance would be in physics, is that you want everything to um, not be top heavy, not be bottom heavy, left or right heavy. Um, so this is just a quick design that I did um, to kind of illustrate what balance is. And you'll notice that even though the left side is more narrow than the right side, because of the way the boxes are aligned and because they have the same height overall between the left and the right column, is that this provides a sense of balance, is that your eye is not thrown off by it, you read things through. I also, um, I'm, I'm using color as another way of illustrating balance. So as um, the colors get, get you know, progressively darker as you move down through the list and then up into the next column. I could do this in the opposite way as well, but this, this you know, is a little bit easier for our eyes because we expect darker to kind of be heavier and more saturated, and so it makes sense for us to have that moving down rather than moving up. Right, and you notice that the large box on the right is in red. So immediately, your I think your eye and your mind thinks, ah, this is important. You know, I, I travel through the smaller boxes, but I get to the larger box. It's a darker color, so it has more weight. Um, and and you know, I'm concluding my my conversation with the result right. in that way. Exactly. 
Um, so next is something called proximity. And proximity really has to do with the way things are grouped. Um, so for instance, I, what I'm illustrating here is that you have these icons, which are just simple circles, um, but they're grouped together because they are like things. Um, if I were to have these scattered throughout randomly, it wouldn't have the kind of proximity relationship that you would be expecting. You'd be kind of, you know, wondering why are things separate. But for instance, I could have moved the text block into the middle and one of the columns of circles over to the right as well. And you would know that these are like things because they're all circles of the same color. So proximity isn't just things grouped next to each other, but also like items grouped throughout a, a document or a group throughout a design. Um, and also, proximity is I've got the um, text as a block as well, um, and that's a way of really kind of offsetting graphical elements from written elements. And, and you notice the text block is also divided, so yeah. it lines up, so, so it has a nice balance with the circles. And the distance between all the circles is the same too. So you, this this identifies the, the circles as a concrete image together too. So your eye does is best is not confusing. It has order to it. Exactly. Um, the next principle we're going to talk about is alignment. And alignment is a very powerful way of um, organizing information that we really don't think about a lot until we run into things that are misaligned. Um, so. Here is just a very simple um, example of like of a, of a um, menu where you've got things running down. They're in the exact same, either they're centered together or they're left justified together. Um, but also there are differences in between them, which really help the eye. But really, what you're looking for is scannability. So I can quickly see how much something costs if I'm if I'm being price conscious, if I'm really looking for what I want, or you know if I'm a more visual person and I want to see representation of what the food is going to be looking like. Obviously, these are just created by me, so they're not you know perfect ones. But um, but I think menus are really great examples of alignment. Um, you also see alignment in. Um, in um, annual reports and things of this nature, where really, it's like as I said, like scannability is really the ideal thing that you're looking for. And I think with library websites, for example, probably even the repetition and alignment of text with images is really helpful. Um, immediately, if these, if these were images around CDs, books, DVDs, for example, um, your eye, just your eye reads, oh yes, okay, and because so much of a, a generation these days looks at images and immediately can see, ah, if they need reinforcement, they'll see that it's eggs. <laughs> yep. But the images uh, speak very much on their own, and then the text is bolded, too, to reinforce it, which works really well. Yeah, and also notice the alignment not only goes down in columns, but across in rows. Um, so if things, were, you know, if, if the pancakes, for instance, weren't quite on the same line, your, your mind would have to work a lot harder to kind of figure out what the price is, of, like you know, what the price is for pancakes, what you know, what they look like, things of this nature. So, like, you really want to think about alignment in more of a three D kind of way, um, rather than just down. It's really down across, and you know, like and orthogonally occasionally. Um, but speaking of repetition, let's go into the next principle, which is repetition. But repetition can be a lot of different things. It can be graphical elements, such as the example with the circles and proximity um, that we did. But also, this is an example of repetition simply using text setting. Um, so a few things you're going to notice right away is that um, all of the headlines are in green. They are in a sans serif font. And they're all uh, capitalized versus the body text, which is in a a, um, a serif font and is black, is smaller, and is all left justified. So you're seeing, you can quickly kind of, as we're talking about with the alignment, you can quickly scan through looking to find things because the repetition is there. Because once you set a precedent of what you want to do, if you keep repeating it, then people become familiar with it very quickly and can really kind of take in the information much more. Yeah, I tend to like the sensory, <laughs> but I know Dan has pointed out to me for sort of friendliness, readability, chunks of text done are done well in a, a font that has a serif. But but to catch the eye, 
and to lead the eye to different blocks of test, text using the sensory and a bulb in a different color really is an effective design principle. Exactly, and also we're going to be talking about this in just a second, but this is also an example of contrast where you've got two different kinds of fonts, you've got you know, two different colors, and you've got two different sizes that really kind of help set things apart as well. So speaking of, um, so contrast is a really, really important part of like of like of a design and, and and like and of showing a data is that you know you don't you only notice things that are different right instead of you know if everything's the same then it's just a block but what the difference is what really outlines what's going on so for instance with this really simple chart on the left a representation of a chart is that you can I you've got because of contrast because of the two different colors and the two different heights, you, you can see immediately what's going on and the relationship between the two of them, which if this were one color, for instance, I would have to use you know, several different um, graphs in order to you know, portray this information. Um, also, on the right, um, you'll notice a lot of ledgers and things like this tend to use alternating colors, and the reason for that is contrast, and it's a way of really allowing um, the data to kind of be aligned and to kind of see what's going on and also to help you quickly scan through things again. Yeah, and sometimes if I don't do things in color, Dan has pointed out to me over the years, even if I use varying shades of gray, um, dark gray, light gray for alternating lines in, a, in what I would call a black and white report as opposed to a color printed report, even that makes it much more readable and much more scannable. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think, just more compelling. It is. You know, it really draws the person in more when there's those small touches that are... Right. It looks like more than an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yes, exactly. So the last principle is space. Um, and so not only where you put things, but the distance that they are between them and the emptiness of that is critical to really good design. Um, so in this way, we're, you know, you're, like, you're seeing a lot of different kind of things going on. There's balance, there's contrast, but what makes this compelling is the space in between them. You notice that the space is exactly the same between the larger circle and the smaller circles, um, and also the padding around it, so kind of the space that goes up to the border on all sides is just as important as where things are in their proximity. Um, also, I'm using space so that there's a centering and then there's another centering within the, between the margins and between the center space. I also, not being a non-designer, but I, someone who appreciates good design, I actually think it's, it's a, a positive thing to really think uh, strategically about using white space. It seems to me a lot of people on websites and reports tend to fill the space with color. And I actually think, as in designing your home, I think plain walls with, with the pops of color in the elements is, is actually much more friendly and compelling design strategy than to, than to put, for example, I really don't think black backgrounds and white letters oftentimes are, are all that, that helpful. Um, it makes it harder to read at times. But I think white space really frees your eye to look at things and it gives an order to a presentation. Exactly. And I think also, um, it's, it's, I think by also not crowding things in is a really right. important thing. It's, it's really easy to kind of make things complicated and fill things in. But you, like everything you want to remember about design and about a data visualization is that your first goal is to communicate. Your second goal is to make it pretty. So if you're not communicating what you're doing, then you're, then you're not meeting your, you know, uh, your design goals. So this is, um, we'll show, Dan's calling it Quit Build of Data. This was an initiative here at the college where we worked on identifying research skills and resources to support the business curriculum. This project came about after a conversation with faculty teaching in the, the fourth year of the business school curriculum. Um, not surprisingly to librarians, um, faculty being somewhat disappointed with students' ability to successfully complete the capstone course. So our approach was to take all the syllabi for all the core courses, tease out the research skills, and then identify the resources that students should be exposed to in order to meet and um, progress through the research skills. So this is just year one. And this was a PowerPoint.
part of the PowerPoint handout. Then we had year two, and again, we list the courses up at the top. You know, notice Dan suggested we use the orange color. This is probably a PowerPoint font. PowerPoint layout you've seen before. Again, listing the resources, well, there are quite a few, listing the research skills, there's year two. Here's year three. Um, for those of us, and those of you interested in information literacy, this is kind of built on Bloom's taxonomy, so the verbiage changes in the research skills to analyze from, to identify, et cetera. And again, the resources for year three. Here's year four. In year four, the students all take one course, which is listed up at the top of management, and then they have a, a, a concentration in finance, international business management, or marketing. And so in that year, there's only one skill that's being added, one task that's being added, depending on their concentration, and you can see how we laid it out. So the slide is different because we're communicating different information. But that's this, this is four years of the business school curriculum, and then what I asked Dan to do was think about how to visually present this because we did a presentation to the curriculum committee of the School of Business. And the next slide is Dan's visual interpretation, which I'll let him talk about. Right. So, you know, you just saw these, these are four slides go by with a lot of really great information, but it's really difficult to synthesize all of that kind of in one. And that I decided to do that. Um, thinking about my audience again is that these are, these are business people. They, um, they really like to follow trends. They like to follow data and the way that data flows, and that, and and with you know, and with our business intelligence as well as like how each point is feeding into the other and how that in essence builds. So what I created is this arc diagram um, of the of the data that was presented, and so. There's a lot of things that you can quickly glean from this. Like, for instance, I'm not sure how clear it is on everyone's screens, but um, the point one E, which is first year, and just point E is a, but um, it's a citing articles using APA, and this is a really you know basic citation is a is a core skill early on, but it really leads into other things so that you kind of need that in order to progress further. Um, so what you're seeing is the way that each um, each of these skills kind of feeds into the other. Um, but in other things, you kind of really quickly see is that, like for instance, marketing like requires a lot more um, research skills than say international business and management. You know, a little bit more than international business and finance, but not as much as say marketing. Um, but you can really see the way that these kind of things come in together and the way that they work and how they flow in from um, like uh, for each other. And and the red the red circles, the orange, the, the green and the blue are corresponding to those previous four slides. Uh, and it, we're just re reiterating the skills. Um, one of our points, I think, in presenting it this way was to make the case to the faculty that 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 Ideally, what we would be able to do in working with them is continually, in a systematic way, be integrated into the curriculum such that there's an intentional linkage between these skills to get to the students being successful in the fourth year capstone courses that we really, we really needed to reinforce skill building and skill use, et cetera. And the lines are, are to show that, yes, this has to be intentional or else you know, if there's a gap, then there will be a gap, and, and we will not achieve the, the success that we could in the four years. Yeah, and then just to kind of bring back some design principles, um, you'll notice that the chart moves from left to right, um, which makes sense, I think, for a lot of us, is that, you know, it's building from, like, year one to year four. Um, also, you'll notice that the spacing is equal between all of the, um, all of the circle points. And, I, and I'm using circles, so for instance, with the capstone courses, the marketing, finance, international business, and management um, are open circles for receiving information. And it's just it's these little small details that really kind of help someone see a lot of information quickly and a lot of data quickly without having to kind of really read each tiny point of it. 
This is uh, a chart which we think is really a n nicely laid out. Um, it's from the Toronto Public Library, and I have to say up front that they had an outside organization um, put together this report, which is it's called martinprosperity.org, and the link will be listed in the lib assessment libguide that Mary Carroll mentioned at the beginning. The, the purpose of this report is to demonstrate the, the impact that the Toronto Public Library has on the city of of Toronto, and you can see how they've laid it out very visually. The, um, the collection use, they're showing total direct tangible benefits, and they've chosen to label things in such a way that they really make their case that the public library system is, is um, making a direct tangible benefit to the city of Toronto. There are intangible benefits, those are smaller. But I think this is really laid out in a nice way, and they have formulas to show. And so they're showing, I mean, the bottom line is for them, the total economic impact is $1 billion. And the report is very well done, so I highly recommend it. But I like the way that on one page they've laid this out in a nice visual way, because the audience for this um, is the author is authorizing body. It's, it's the public as well. And you can see $1 invested equals $5.63 of economic impact. And we think this is just laid out in a really visually nice way. Mm -hmm. I think this is really clever in a way that they don't think they've used contrasts excellently. For instance, like you'll notice that the total direct tangible benefits are all in shades of blue. And they kind of show you exactly what part of the pie chart that that is accounting for um, versus the others with the with the, a total indirect and with the total um, um, spending overall. Um, also, they're really combining in a nice um, in the center, A, because it, you know, it, this, is, this is the center of their money, is their city, is their people, and is their, you know, their homes and families. And that's a really kind of smart way of kind of putting something to the heart of it, but also combining in that data to show what's going on. This is a really clever way of displaying a lot of important information. And as Dan pointed out, I like the fact that in addition to just creating the pie here, that they've They've intentionally added the line around the entire blue to say total direct tangible benefits, adding that all up. They're reinforcing the impact that all of the blue shaded area has. They're re, you know, they've added that on as an additional element to make their point, yep. which I think is well done. It's very excellent. This is a more common thing that you're seeing in libraries. I believe, this is Nevada State College, and I believe they're using um, Tableau um, or Tableau Public Software. We're seeing more of this in libraries to make their case about the use of the library. They've obviously pulled down some data from um, probably from their, their, their LDAP system, their directory system, and they're demonstrating who is using the library by academic level, by gender, ethnicity. You can see um, GPA. They've been able to pull some of that down. And I guess they've been able to identify users by their major, too. So they're making their point. And I think the colors are striking. Um, they're making their point well with it. Uh, at the top, you see library use by students, which um, fluctuates, obviously, again. Um, but I think the, the graphic colors at the bottom really make a nice um, visual case for who's using the library. And I, I'll, I'll let Dan comment from the designer point of view. Yeah, I think you know this is like you know, for instance, with the overall use, with the with the myriad of different colors, is that it shows that this is you know, a, like a complex system and a complex graph. I mean, I think my one criticism of this would be that it's, it is a little busy, that you have a lot of information that you're, that you're trying to, um, that you're trying to get through. And, and it does that effectively, but it's, it's a little bit more to take in than, say, something a little bit simpler. But, you know, I mean, there's a lot of information to kind of be, to be showing. So I think maybe if I were to do an improvement, for instance, like I may switch between bar graphs and pie charts just to give a little more visual interest and just for the simpler ones to really show what's going on in a little bit simpler way. We have a database. Um, it's a licensed database for which we pay called Statista, which we just started, I think we subscribed this summer, last summer for the first time. Um, and I've it's an interesting database. We, we actually subscribed for use by our business and our communications schools. And what Statista does is, in addition to having data and sources of data, there are a lot of there are sometimes infographics 
associated with data. And we thought this was a nice example of a visualization of data. And I'll let Dan talk about why, why he thinks it's successful, but I immediately can see coffee and tea and understand what is coffee and what is tea. So I think what is so clever about this one is that they're really kind of riffing off of pie charts. These obviously are not pie charts because 42 and 42 percent do not equal 100 percent. Um, but but it's a really clever way of really kind of showing this really cool data. And you're seeing quickly that as people age, coffee use goes up and tea use goes down, at least for the for the sample group. Um, but also, like you know, we you've got two different browns, the darker and the light brown. You've got the coffee stains, and you've got these circles, which you know most cups are circles. And it's a really just very clever way of showing uh, some interesting data in really simple, succinct ways. Yeah, I can see doing this for um, students, maybe by majors again, maybe by discipline, um, maybe type of resource uh, again, because you visually look at this and you can immediately understand what is what. Um, using the colors, using the size of the circles, there's not a lot of content here, but but you can read it without really having to to suss it out all that much, and it makes pretty good sense. So we really think this is a nice um, a nice example of an infographic, and if you happen to um, look at Statista at some point, you'll see that they have a variety of, of good examples. They do have a lot of pie charts and bar graphs as well, but they've got some additional services that they put in that, that do, I think, interesting infographics like this. Mm -hmm. And I think also, like, there's a really clever use of contrast as well. If you look at the coffee cup and the tea cup, you notice that the handles are on opposite sides. Um, that's a really it's just it's just a small way of showing a difference, but it's enough. And the little tea bag, you know, it's a nice little spot of color that's not seen anywhere else. Like these are really nice ways of showing contrast and showing like differences. And they're subtle and tiny, and your brain barely picks them up, but but they are there, and it helps to you know show those differences. So this is another example of a of a visual built by Dan for our library, um, similar to the School of Business. Um, work collaboration. We worked with we work with individual dis academic disciplines on identifying research skills and building uh, hopefully an integrated collaborative path for students to develop the research skills. In this case it's our speech pathology um, discipline at the college. And again we took all of the this, the syllabi, we teased out all the learning outcomes. We identified the library resources that should be introduced to students, and we, pr we produced this, which we, the Health Sciences Librarian and I presented this to the entire School of, of Health Sciences Human Performance, I think the year before last fall. Um, and our purpose in this was to, again, show the, the linkages, um, the skill set, and, and I'll mention something that I'll let Dan talk about from a design point of view. But what, what we discovered in, in putting this together was just naturally that as students went up through the curriculum, there were fewer newer resources being introduced, so you can see there are fewer search strategies. Uh, that's really heavy in the second year. Fewer resources because students are being introduced to the resources. They're becoming familiar. They're utilizing them. And there's more assessment and more analysis and synthesis taking part on the part of the students, and it's all combined in the fourth year. And this was, I think, a really effective way on Dan's part to demonstrate to the faculty what was happening in the curriculum and, and how, how we in the library had determined that and how we might support it. Yeah, and I, again, um, when I was working with our health sciences librarian, I was you know, asking her about like, you know, what kind of people are, you know, are the people in uh, speech language pathology and, you know, and like how, how, do they, how do they see things, how do they interpret data? And we talked about data and how important data was and to be able to like kind of prove a you know prove a like a prove a um, hypothesis. And so this is why I decided to kind of uh, simulate a bar graph slightly um, with the with the numbers and with the columns to try to show that like the earlier that we can start introducing resources and basic library skills, 
the more they're going to become useful as, um, as assessment and as analysis and uh, synthesis is happening. And that if they're coming in later, they're not going to have the skills building up to that. Um, so it was really, it was really kind of my way of showing that how heavy things have to be on um, on the like introduction of of our, our resources and of our search strategies first to really allow for analysis to happen later on in the in the uh, later years. And we actually we don't have it here a slide, but we had um, slides as we did for the business school laying out each year the skill sets that you see here and the additional resources to be introduced. Um, it works well in some of our applied disciplines such as speech path um, because we could model the Bloom's taxonomy quite well. You'll see there's introduced PICO model which is the patient intervention something and something I forget <laughs> what it stands for but then in year two there's develop a therapy based clinical question using PICO and in the third year, there's developed diagnostic, etiologic, and prognostic clinical questions using PICO. So we were able to demonstrate through the linkages here that, that this was happening, should be happening in a systematic way, and the students should be basically continuing to progress and make more progressive use and analysis of the resources using this model that was introduced in the first year, ideally. And I think faculty really understood this. In this case also, uh, for an example, um, we also looked at the um, professional association, which is ASHA, the Speech and Hearing uh, Association. We looked at the, the information that's required from ASHA, and we incorporated some of the ASHA context into here. We're right now working with our occupational therapy program, which has an external accrediting agency, and we're really looking at that their professional association ethics and codes as well to incorporate that into it. But this was a really, I think, a really effective way to communicate what we saw as, one, the role of the library in student preparation and student success, and the collaborative opportunity that could happen if we systematically work towards um, this model, which really supports both teaching and learning success. And it, it was very positively received by the faculty. And as a result of doing one presentation for the whole school, we had several other departments in the school request the same kind of collaborative work with us. Yeah. Um, so next, there's, there is a help post video that many of you, if you're Facebookers, may have seen come across your uh, feed. Um, but we thought this is a really compelling way of showing data in a more live set. And obviously, we're not going to play the video right now, but um, we did just kind of do some snapshots. So basically, the premise was they got 100 people together. Um, 50 had identified as Democrats. 50 had identified as Republicans. Um, and so all the Democrats are wearing blue shirts. All the Republicans are wearing red shirts. Um, and they threw them into this gym, and they created these two large circles, enough to hold approximately, you know, enough to kind of crowd people in. And so they just started calling out questions. And one of the questions they called out is, would uh, Bernie Sanders make a good president? And then next you can see where the left is the yes, and the right is the no, and the people moving. And this is where they kind of ended up. So you can see that, as you would expect, most Republicans would say no. Um, most Democrats would say yes. Um, but here you've got color, you've got contrast, you've got circles. Like you've got all the really fun elements of data visualization, but in a live way of doing it. And and you can watch the, the video on, on on YouTube because they also ask whether Donald Trump would make a good president. And it's interesting. You can see people contemplating which in which circle they want to go. It's not all. Up. I think, you know, maybe libraries, I, I thought about maybe we could dress students up in first year, second year, third year, fourth year, different colored t-shirts and ask them questions. How often do you use the library? Once a week, you know, twice a week. Are you here at night time? Are you here in the daytime? Do you use our e-books? Um, I think for public libraries, this would really be a great way to make a short video if you're doing a promotional campaign or, or you're doing some kind of a the campaign around highlighting your services for people. I can see homeschoolers, grandparents. Um, it, it has a real nice visual element to it. And, and it's an easy, I think, thing to do. And we completely, and if you watch the video, you'll see 
the interaction of people. It puts a real human touch on it, and I, I think it's a real effective way to communicate information in an active way. It's not a bar graph, uh, and I can see where you know um, testimonials sometimes are people are funders are are um, that's impressive if they can get a qualitative versus a quantitative if they can get a sense that people are really engaged. It's not just you have data, you are presenting data, they are looking at data in a chart. Here are people who've come in who are committed to your library, let's say, and are helping you make the case in a visual way. I think this could be a real compelling uh, way to, to make your case and to present data to your audience. In a very human way, I mean, these are faces and people that, you know, we recognize as ourselves, and that's a really important aspect of drawing in an audience, drawing in your users. Uh, so let's just quickly talk about just some of the different um, data visualization tools out there. There are there are tons of them. This is just a scattering of some of the major ones. Um, so Infogram is really great for doing infographics. It does a lot of drag and drop. Um, it can take in information and digest it for you and give you suggestions. There's really a lot of really compelling ways of of creating it. They're really super simple and for, you know, any kind of level of user. Um, Tableau is another one that we had talked about before. It's a, it's a way of really showing a lot of charts and opening quickly, putting a lot of information and allowing it to kind of um, do that for you. And Tableau um, comes, as with many of these apps that Dan will talk about, Tableau comes in different flavors and there's a version called Tableau Public which is which uh, it really doesn't have that many limitations, but it, it is free and open access to use. And then, of course, there's the for for price model that has a little more functionality. The trade-off with Tableau Public is that whatever you create then um, goes into their database of public displays. So you wouldn't want to put something proprietary up there. But there is a a version of Tableau that is free called Tableau Public. Um, and also, I've included um, Microsoft Office because it has Publisher, PowerPoint. Um, there's a lot of like really pretty, pretty straightforward drag and drop tools to really allow someone to create something really compelling. I mean, even within Excel, is you know you can create charts and graphs, and you know there and just even simple ones really help draw people in and help make the data much more easy to digest and much more easy to kind of read the trends on. Um, also, I've included Keynote, which is what we're presenting on right now, and um, and also the Adobe Creative Cloud. So I created a lot of the graphics within Illustrator, which has a fairly steep learning curve. It's not impossible, but it's a little bit steeper out there. But it also includes a lot of ways of doing charts and graphs um, within Illustrator as well. And you know, Photoshop, you can use all of these different kind of tools to prevent, or sorry, to represent your data in a really effective way. Yeah, and even me, who, who's not uh, graphically, um, whatever, skilled per se, even I can see the advantage of using, uh, basically turning handouts out of PowerPoint slides. I'm using PowerPoint. I, I will do some of that at times. And, and using some of the functionality that just comes in Office, as it were, it seems to really, um, it can be, be very effective. Uh, one of the things I've always tried to do in a presentation, and we've done it somewhat today as well, is if you're doing a presentation, if you can use images um, that are compelling and that get your story across, I think that it is very effective. Um, I see a lot of what I would call death by PowerPoint, um, where you know your slides all have text on them, and essentially you're just repeating and parroting back the text that's on the slides and, and, and the numbers. If you can use images and, and graphic information um, to, to convey the same information, you will hold the audience's attention and it will be, I think, much more effective um, and actually probably has more staying power than, than just a series of numbers or, or charts. If you can give visual information, it seems to work really well. All right, so we are going to take some questions now, and I see one, pardon me, let me just get that back.
Yeah, we do have one question so far. Jean Jenkins was asking which of those uh, resources that you just shared are free, and do you know which ones work on Mac or Windows? Um, all of those are platform agnostic, um, and some of the free ones include, um, sorry, let me just get back to that slide. Um, some of the free ones um, include Infogram, Tableau, and I think PictoChart has some free options. Um, if you just, I just Google, you know, free a data visualization, and there's tons of them out there. Um, but uh, the, the uh, Creative Cloud is pretty expensive. It's about $30 a month for, for non-educational use. Um, and Keynote is free if, it's, if you're on a Mac. Um, and PowerPoint is not free, but it's cheap. Right. I, I think Key, Keynote is one of the, the suite of um, software apps that comes um, with Macs. Any other question? Joyce Rambo is asking, uh, what are the best fonts to use visually? <laughs> oh, that's such a great question. Um, I'm sorry, there's a bit of an echo happening. Let me just, I'm just going to keep going. I'm just, I apologize for the echo. Um, fonts are, really tr are a really tricky one. I tend to stick with fonts. Um, that people are familiar with. Uh, Helvetica is always a great choice. Uh, Universe is a great choice as well. Um, I really like Avenir. Uh, there's a ton of them out there. But um, I think you just want to watch out for kind of the cloning ones, such as Papyrus, Comic Sans, um, Impact is overused now with memes and stuff like that. So those are the ones that I watch out for. Yeah, I think, you know, not that I have had expertise in this, but you're not writing a wedding invitation, you know, so I think scrolly, flowery things are distracting from, from your message. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Verheyen is asking if a recording and slides will be made available, and yes, we will be sending out a recording to all of the registrants, and the slides will be available as well. And um, there are some sites that, that we did not add into the presentation due to time that we will add in the LibGuide that are um, from some libraries. I think if you take a look at the, the top page of the Fairfield University um, website, that's Fairfield University in Connecticut, they have an interesting graphic, um, but it, it, it's live on the web and we didn't want to try to go there today. Um, and obviously some of you know that Ohio State's done some work with Tableau Public, Ohio State University Libraries, and they've got, uh, they've just written an article on CRL News. We'll put that link up as well. Great. And I also like to add, um, whenever we're talking about design, there is a site called Librarian Design Share, and people share some of these designs that they've created and I think they kind of make them available publicly for other people to kind of copy and use what they'd be interested in using. So that's a really great resource for those of us who are more design challenged. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, and also um, within um, ALA, the uh, LAMA, the Library Administration and Management um, Division of ALA, um, every year um, there's a PR section uh, in, in Lama, and they do, um, at the annual conference, they do, a, I think they call it a PR showcase now, and libraries uh, put up their um, end reports, um, strategic plans, programming, etc. And I think sometimes the winners are on the web, so you can take a look at the Lama website and see um, what award, what publications, web-based things have won awards as well, so that's a good source for successful um, visual um, presentation. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much, Liz and Dan. I really enjoyed that presentation. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. And like I said, we'll be sending out a link to the recording as well as a follow-up survey. And stay tuned for those future assessment webinars that Mary Carol mentioned.
One thing that I'll just mention, and here because I forgot, is that Dan alluded to it. We do a lot of usability testing here. Uh, quite a bit. We do some um, heat mapping to see what people are using and that informs our design and we will be bringing up a new library website in January so take a look at that because that's been informed by design principles and by usability testing with faculty and staff and students. Speaking of heat maps are also great data visualizations. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much. And have a Thank good day, you. everyone. Thank you.